Hello, and thank you for joining us for episode 57 of the Aviation News Talk podcast, where we bring you, what else, general aviation news and helpful information that pilots like you can actually put to use someday. Today, we're going to talk about my evaluation of the best headlamp solutions out there for night flying, and that's based on listener recommendations and my evaluation of them. And the FAA has new guidance on flying at non-towered airports, and I'm sure some of you are doing some of the things that the FAA now says, meh, you shouldn't be doing. And we'll also be sharing listener feedback and answering some listener questions. Plus, coming up in the news, we'll talk about two recent GA aircraft accidents and tell you why the FAA thinks that one of them is the most likely kind of accident for airliners to have in the future. And an April Fool's joke just seemed a little too real for some people in our industry, forcing the FAA to respond. And finally, an innovative aircraft that could reduce the cost of flight training. Well, it's just made its first flight, and we'll tell you what makes that plane special. Welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk about general aviation. I'm Max Truscott. I'm here to educate and inform you as a pilot or student pilot, and let's have some fun along the way. I've been a pilot for over 40 years. I'm author of the G1000 Glass Cockpit Handbook and the 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year. And these days, I'm a specialist in Cirrus aircraft like the SR-20 and SR-22. Now, last week in episode 56, we talked about visual separation and the responsibility that pilots assume when they agree to maintain visual separation. So if you missed that episode, you may want to check it out. This week, we have audio feedback on that episode from Senior Flying Magazine editor Rob Mark. All this and more, and the news starts now. From avweb.com, a rather unusual accident, the NTSB and Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University officials are working to determine what caused a PA-28R-201, that's a Piper Arrow, what caused its wing to fall off in mid-flight on April the 4th. The resulting accident killed two people, Zach Capra, who was an Embry-Riddle student, and FAA-designated examiner John Asma, who was conducting a check ride. Flight training resumed on Thursday of that week for all aircraft at Embry-Riddle, except for PA-28s. They remain grounded until inspections are completed. The Daytona Beach News Journal reports that witnesses, including air traffic controllers, said the aircraft's wing departed the aircraft, causing it to spin out of control and then slam into a field about a half mile from Daytona Beach International Airport. NTSB investigator Aaron McCarter said during a news conference Thursday they are focusing their initial efforts on that fact. They are looking at maintenance and engineering records, and the maintenance records for the Piper Arrow have already been provided by the school. The investigation into the crash will include metallurgists examining the plane's wreckage, but a wing detaching in flight is very rare. There are at least two special airworthiness information bulletins. Uh, that would be CE-11-13 and CE-11-12R1, saying that aircraft have the potential for corrosion on the wing and front spar at the fuselage attached fitting. One warns the potential for corrosion of the wing's rear spar at the fuselage attached fitting. These SAIBs mention the increased risk associated with high moisture and salt water. And of course, Daytona Beach uh, has a lot of that. Capper was on a check ride for his commercial certificate, and he was set to graduate on May the 7th. The ongoing investigation may take between 18 months to two years, which is typical for the NTSB. From FlyingMagazine.com, on April 2nd, two people died in the collision of a Cessna Citation CJ jet and a Cessna 150 at the Marion, Indiana Municipal Airport at about 5 p.m. local time. Now, Marion is located about 50 miles northeast of Indianapolis. While the details are still preliminary, the FAA believes the Citation was still rolling out after a landing when it was struck by the Cessna 150 as the single-engine aircraft was taking off. By the way, they have intersecting runways at this airport. The 150 completely sheared off the tail of the Citation during the accident and then crashed near the side of the runway before catching fire. The two fatalities occurred in the Cessna 150 and are believed to have been two firefighters from the Madison County, Indiana area. No one aboard the Citation was reported to have been injured in the accident. Local news footage appears to show the accident happened near the intersection of the airport's two runways, and Marion Airport is a non-controlled facility. I mention this because the FAA has said in recent years that they expect that the next major airliner accident will occur on the ground, uh, just as this type of collision did. They've done such a good job of trying to eliminate accidents in the air in the airliner world that they now believe that uh, issues on the ground may cause the next future major airliner accident here in the United States. So I think the thing for all pilots to do, especially when you're at non-tarred airports with intersecting runways, 
be especially cautious to make sure there are no other aircraft that are taking off and landing on the other uh, runway. And of course, radio communications is really essential. It'll be interesting to see what the NTSB has to say. The preliminary report is not out yet. I did post a photo on our Patreon page when this first occurred. Just go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, and you can see a photo of what remained of the uh, two aircraft afterwards. And also from flyingmagazine.com, Cirrus has claimed one of the most prestigious aviation awards, the 2017 Robert J. Collier Trophy for its SF-50 Vision Jet. Now, that award's been handed out for over 100 years. I remember first reading about it in the pages of Flying Magazine as a teenager. And NAA President Greg Principato said that, quote, by revolutionizing general and personal aviation, Cirrus aircraft with their Vision Jet has added to a great and historic Collier legacy. Now, the trophy is awarded each year, quote, for the greatest achievements in aeronautics or astronautics in America with respect to improving the performance, efficiency, and safety of air or space vehicles, the value of which has been thoroughly demonstrated by actual use during the preceding year. The selection committee for the Collier includes 25 aviation and aerospace professionals. This year, there were nine nominees, and Cirrus was selected for, quote, designing, certifying, and entering into service the Vision Jet, the world's first single-engine general aviation personal jet aircraft with a whole airframe parachute system. Of course, we talked about the Vision Jet way back at episode 11 when we interviewed people from Cirrus, and I sat in the jet and uh, described it back here on this podcast. And a couple of months ago on episode 490 of the the Airplane Geeks podcast, all five of the guest hosts uh, picked who their choice was for the Collier Trophy, and I picked the Cirrus. Nobody else did. And having sat on the, that committee, I was on the selection committee in 2015, I just kind of thought that they might want to move it around a little bit. The last couple of uh, uh, awards, including the year I was there, uh, were for aerospace-type systems, so I thought that perhaps they might uh, be more inclined to pick good old hardware that flies in the sky, and sure enough, the Cirrus Jet won this year. So our Congratulations to Cirrus for an amazing aircraft and a great award. And I mentioned at the beginning an April Fool's joke, and so I want to give a tip of the hat and a hearty congratulations to Paul Bertarelli of avweb.com. Boy, he wrote a good one. <laughs> I used to write some of the April Fool's stories that appeared on aeronews.net, so I know how hard it is to do this. But, Paul, you really knocked this one out of the park. Great job. So the headline is FAA extends ADSB mandate to 2040. And the article says, conceding that aircraft owners and even airlines aren't equipping quickly enough with ADSB, the FAA on Sunday announced that it's extending the mandate deadline to January 1, 2020. Previously, the equipage deadline was 2020. Quote, our data shows that the fleet won't have installation equipage sufficient to make next gen even marginally operative, unquote, an FAA spokesman said over the weekend. Therefore, the agency will move the deadline to 2040, by which time it expects at least half of owners to have equipped. The agency added that given price trends on ADSB technology, owners will be able to equip their aircraft with by then obsolete technology for about 10% of current cost. To encourage equipage, the FAA will offer a second ADSB rebate similar to the $500 pot sweetener it announced last year to prime the installation pump. This time, another 20,000 owners will be eligible for the rebate, which the FAA says will be $25. AvWeb will have more information on the rebate when it becomes available. However, owners can pre-register for the rebate program at this site. Well, apparently a lot of people believe this story, even though it was published on April 1st. And oddly enough, I got an email a couple of days later from somebody who had read the story over the weekend. This person works for a large government agency that I will not name. And they said, gee, perhaps we should go ahead and change the agenda for the upcoming seminar because of this new announcement related to ADSB. So I sent them a link to the story and said, you know, you might want to click on those links, which took uh, people to a list of 10 greatest April Fool's jokes. Well, <laughs> enough people believe this that a few days later, the FAA came out with this news release. They said, we have a sense of humor too, but April Fool's jokes that the Federal Aviation Administration is extending the ADSB deadline is just that. As stated in the final rule published with industry input in May 2010, all aircraft flying in designated controlled airspace, generally the same busy airspace where transponders are currently required, must be equipped with ADSB out avionics by January 1, 2020. Only aircraft that fly in uncontrolled airspace and aircraft without electrical systems, such as balloons and gliders, are exempt from the mandate. 
Those who've already equipped understand that ADSB is transforming the nation's airspace by providing more precision and reliability than the current radar system, enhancing safety and increasing situational awareness. Time is running out. There are only 21 months left until the deadline. If you have any questions about equipage, whether you need to or not, what equipment to get, please see the FAA's Equip ADSB website. So everyone likes a good April Fool's joke. This one really was fantastic. So again, congratulations, Paul Burrelli from AvWeb. And turning now to international news, this comes from AOPA.org. It's also about ADSB, though I don't think it's an April Fool's joke. The headline says, Canada ADSB mandate moves closer. And they mentioned that on March 30th, 10 additional Iridium Next satellites were launched into orbit, bringing the total to 50. And that Arion, that's A-I-R-E-O-N, has an ADSB payload aboard each of those satellites. Now, that successful launch and delivery means that Canada is moving closer to their own ADSB out mandate. And when that comes, it'll be for the 1090 megahertz extended squitter technology. Now, in addition to 1090 ES, the FAA also provides the option for ADSB out on 970. 78 megahertz universal access transceiver frequency. However, 1090 ES is the only international standard and no other countries have embraced the use of this 978 universal downlink that we have here in the U.S. as an alternative. Now, last fall, NAV Canada published a terms of reference document initiating an aeronautical study to define a Canadian ADSB out mandate. Under the document's timeline, the study will be completed this spring and undergo approvals and safety oversight reviews sometime later this year. Now, the 978 UAT data link will not be compliant with this anticipated Canadian mandate. However, AOPA has pressed the issue of overflights in southern Canada, where, by the way, all the radar systems will be retained, and has said that NAV Canada is at least considering that Mode C aircraft might be exempted from the ADSB mandate uh, in the southern part of Canada if they're flying in and out of the United States. A Canadian mandate probably would begin in 2021, according to AOPA. Now, this news story was sent to us from Patrick via Facebook in Australia, and this comes from the Australian.com.au. It says, Aviation Reform Grounded by Barnaby's Successor. And the story goes on to say, a push to reform aviation laws to reduce crippling cost and red tape appears grounded with new minister Michael McCormick refusing to embrace changes agreed to by his predecessor. Former air safety boss Dick Smith in February claimed to have secured a commitment from then Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce and Labor's Anthony Albanese for bipartisan changes to the Civil Aviation Act. Changes were aimed at reducing what Mr. Smith and others in the industry see as a needlessly costly and onerous regulatory burden on general aviation. Mr. Smith told The Australian that in discussions last week with Mr. Joyce's replacement, Michael McCormick, he refused to embrace the reforms. Mr. McCormick, who became Deputy Prime Minister and Transport Minister on February 26, confirmed that he has yet to back changes. However, he insisted he was still considering them, quote, I have met Dick Smith and spoken to him a number of times on the general aviation regulations, he said. While I understand Mr. Smith's passion on this matter, my job is to ensure policy changes are given the due consideration needed. I will take the time needed to consider options and to have further conversations with industry and my colleagues. You cannot rush policy outcomes, especially when it involves people people's safety. If changes are possible, they will be properly considered and broad consultation will be held before any decision is made. Mr. Smith said he was convinced Mr. McCormick had effectively dumped the reforms. Quote, it was very clear to me that he was going to do absolutely nothing. He will sit on the fence, Mr. Smith said. He also said that the act's current wording on the primacy of safety was a lie, with big airlines able to use their clout to balance safety with affordability, leaving the less powerful general aviation sector to cop the brunt of needless red tape. Casa said it has already obliged to consider the cost impacts of decisions, although Mr. Smith said the obligation was contained in guiding principles rather than being a key feature of the act. In avionics news, and this comes from flyingmagazine.com, U Avionics introduces a new low cost ADSB product. So they now have two products to fit into their expanding portfolio of low cost, easy to install ADSB solutions for general aviation. The first is a taillight replacement ADSB out unit, similar in concept to the Sky Beacon red LED nav light replacement the company unveiled last year. And I think we talked about this on the show. The second is a green nav light replacement for ADSB in receiver that allows buyers to receive subscription 
friction-free weather and traffic information on a tablet computer in the cockpit. So think about that. You can replace your left beacon with ADS-B out, your right beacon with ADS-B in. Rather clever. So both of these solutions are designed to meet the FAA's 2020 mandate. Company CEO Shane Woodson told Flying at last week's Aircraft Electronic Association show in Las Vegas that FAA TSO approval of Sky Beacon is expected in four to six weeks, while the Tail Beacon products should reach the market before the end of the year. Price for the Sky Beacon unit is targeted at $1,500, while the Tail Beacon unit is expected to sell for $2,000. Woodson said UAvionics hopes to bundle the green Navlite replacement ADS-B in with the Sky Beacon or Tail Beacon for an all-in price that is still less than competing ADS-B products. When sold alone, the ADS-B in product is expected to sell for around $800. Because the inventive products plug into the slots previously occupied by traditional Navlites, the installation can be completed in as little as 10 minutes with just a screwdriver. And I think anybody who's bought avionics for an aircraft knows that installation can be a major portion of the total cost. So I think just as Aspen a number of years ago introduced a glass panel, which was a very low cost to install because it just slipped into the slot for pre-existing attitude indicator and, and DG, this too looks like a great solution. So uh, hats off to Avionics for coming up with some easy to install, low cost ADSB solutions. And finally, this also from FlyingMagazine.com, the all-electric Bi Aerospace Sunflyer 2 took its first flight on April 10th at the Centennial Airport. With clear blue skies over Denver and perfect conditions, quote, we had a fantastic first flight, said Bi Aerospace President Charlie Johnson. And CEO of Bi Aerospace George Bai said that the short and very successful flight met or exceeded the flight test targets. Now, a final selection for the electric motor to power the production model of the Sunflyer 2 has not yet been selected, but Bi Aerospace said the power plant will soon be announced. However, the energy storage system has been selected. It's going to be the LG Chem MJ1 lithium ion battery cells, which offers a 260 watt hour per kilogram energy density. The battery will provide a 3.5 hour flight endurance for the Sunflyer 2 by said significant improvement over Pipistrel's Alpha Electroelectric 2 seat trainer, which has only a one hour endurance with reserve. Quote, lower operating costs are key to solving the student pilot dropout rate, which is curtailing the successful attainment of badly needed airline pilots, by said. He went on to say that the Sunflyer 2's $3 per hour operating cost is 10 times lower than traditional piston engine flight trainers with no carbon emissions missions and significantly reduce noise. Well, personally, I'm very excited to hear this. Back in 2011, I watched my first flight of uh, electric aircraft at Oshkosh. And ever since then, I've been saying we needed a trainer with at least a two hour endurance to be able to have a practical flight lesson. And wow, with 3.5 hour endurance, I think the, this might be the solution. So really fantastic. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up, my evaluation of six different headlamp solutions that listeners like for night flying. Plus, listener feedback and questions, including one listener who passes along another idea for identifying the runway orientation at unfamiliar airports, and another listener who asks, what's the best time of year to fly his 172 from New York City across the country, and what route should he take? Stick around. We'll be right back here on the Aviation News Talk Podcast. Welcome back. Before we talk about night flying solutions, let me give you a few quick updates. The FAA has just come out with an updated version of their advisory circular for non-towered airport flight operations. Now, we talked about non-towered airport operations in detail last year in episodes 22 and 24. This AC just came out last month in March, and I put a link to it on our Patreon page. It is better written, I think, than the prior one, which was issued back in 1995, I believe, and includes some new information. Uh, let me just go ahead and hit a couple of highlights here that stuck out at me. Now, these aren't necessarily all new things, but thought you'd be interested in it. Uh, one thing I saw was it says the FAA does not regulate traffic pattern entry, only traffic pattern flow. And they give an example for a VFR aircraft on a long straight in approach for landing that never enters the traffic pattern. Uh, you can, of course, do your long straight in and you won't be considered using the traffic pattern flow unless you perform a go around or a touch and go after the landing. Now, of course, the FAA encourages pilots to use the standard traffic pattern entry on the 45 when arriving or departing a non-towered airport or a part-time towered airport when the control tower is not operating 
particularly when there's other traffic in the pattern or if you're operating from an unfamiliar airport. They say, however, there are occasions when a pilot can choose to execute a straight in approach for landing when not intending to enter the traffic pattern, such as a visual approach executed as part of the termination of an instrument approach. Pilots should clearly communicate on the CTAF frequency and coordinate maneuvering for and execution of the landing with other traffic so as not to disrupt the flow of other traffic. So here's the key takeaway. If you're landing straight in for whatever reason, you should give way to people who are flying the standard traffic pattern. And therefore, pilots operating the traffic pattern, you should be alert at all times to aircraft that are executing straight in landings, particularly when you are flying the base leg prior to turning final. And I saw this ooh, probably about a year or so ago down at the San Martin Airport. I was on downwind, a plane ahead of me was on base, and the aircraft, which was a 172, not using its radio, performed a straight in, and the guy on base had to alter course to avoid him. Now, that's a case where they did not follow the protocol. If you're going to be flying straight in, you should give way, which this pilot did not, to people who were flying the normal traffic pattern. Here's something else. They say that self-announced transmissions may include the aircraft type, such as Cirrus or Cessna or Piper, to aid in identification and detection, but should not use paint schemes or color descriptions to replace the use of the aircraft call sign. Boy, I hear this all the time. And this AC says you're not supposed to do it. They give examples. Midwest Traffic Twin Commander 51 Romeo Foxtrot, 10 miles to the northeast, or Midwest Traffic 51 Romeo Foxtrot Twin Commander, 10 miles northeast, but not Midwest Traffic Blue and White Twin Commander, 10 miles northeast. Do you hear the uh, difference there? You are supposed to use your call sign. If you want to mention what type of aircraft you are, you can do that, but you're not supposed to do that in lieu of using your call sign. Uh, let's see, when referring to a specific runway, they say pilots should use the runway number and not use the phrase active runway because there is no official active runway at a non-towered airport. <laughs> and I guess I do that when I'm taking you off from a non-towered airport. We'll say we're taking the active runway 32 and departing. Yeah, it's not the active runway, but uh, anyway, I'll try to avoid using that phrase in the future. And here's a favorite. They say, note, pilots are reminded that the use of the phrase any traffic in the pattern, please advise, is not a recognized self-announced position and or intention phrase and should not be used under any condition. So that's pretty clear here. Uh, they say, don't use the phrase, any traffic in the area, please advise. They say that any traffic that is present at the time of your self-announcement that is capable of radio communication should reply without being prompted to do so. And I would say, just listen up. In fact, start listening before 10 miles out. And you already have a pretty good idea of how many aircraft are in the pattern and where they're located. And they also take uh, something here from the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge, which is an FAA publication. And this is not new, but they go ahead and reiterate that there is both a preferred and an alternate way to enter a pattern if you have to cross across the middle of the field to get to the traffic pattern side. The preferred method, which we talked about, is to cross overhead midfield 500 feet above the traffic pattern. Now, locally, most of our examiners recommend that pilots cross 1,000 feet above the traffic pattern. Then after you cross midfield, you're going to continue to fly at least two miles past the airport. That gets you out and beyond the downwind leg. You're going to start your descent after you fly over the downwind leg and then turn to enter on the 45. Now, if it's left traffic, for example, after you fly over the airport, as you're descending, you'll make a right turn so that you enter on the 45 for left traffic. Now, the alternate way that you can use to get across the airport to enter the pattern According to the AC, this alternate method should not be used when the pattern is congested. So please keep that in mind. And that method, which you can use when the pattern is relatively empty, is to fly straight across the middle of the field, but at pattern altitude. And then you can turn directly into the downwind. But they say if you do this, that is, that if you fly across the middle of the field at pattern altitude, you are to yield. That is, that you are to give way to pilots who are flying the preferred traffic pattern and entered on the 45 or on the downwind leg. Now, I know some folks will say that, gosh, Max, this is just an advisory circular. It's not regulatory. <laughs> well, let me just uh, tell you what they say, you know, from Wikipedia. And I know that's not an official source, but I'm sure we can find the same information elsewhere. 
They say that ACs define acceptable means, but not the only means of accomplishing or showing compliance with airworthiness regulations. They say they're generally informative in nature. ACs are neither binding nor regulatory, yet have the effect of de facto standards or regulations. And I can assure you that if you were on a witness stand, a lawyer would ask you if you comply with all FAA standard practices, and they would consider this a standard practice. So yeah, it's not regulatory, but I I think it could probably be held against you if you chose not to do it unless you had incredibly good reason. So that's the update there. I've put a link on the Patreon page, so you can just go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, click on post, and you'll find a link to it there on our page. And in other updates, I've had a very heavy travel schedule the last couple of weeks, which is why it's been two weeks since I released an episode. Now, I was joking with someone online that I need one of those mobile TV news vans so that I can produce new podcast episodes, even when I'm on the road. Now, the first trip was the flight I mentioned in the last episode, and that was from Davis, California to Macon, Georgia, in a 2006 Cirrus with the buyer. Uh, There was one significant hiccup with that trip. There always seems to be one. And that was that the buyer's loan didn't fund until the day after we had originally planned to leave. So I spent an extra day in Davis uh, just pouring over the aircraft to make sure it was in good shape and teaching the owner about pre-flighting an SR-22. And we were able to get on the road just before noon on the second day that I was there. And I'm not going to give you much more detail on that trip as the buyer has agreed to record an interview about that trip, which I'll plan to bring to you soon. And then one day after I got back home here in Northern California, I hopped on a Southwest jet bound for Las Vegas to attend the Cirrus CPPP, or Pilot Proficiency Program. Now, that's a weekend-long training program model on the American Bonanza Society's BPPP, which we discussed uh, last year in Episode 20. Most CPPPs offer attendees the option of either spending the entire weekend in ground school or to spend part of the weekend flying with a CSIP instructor, that's a Cirrus uh, standardized instructor, and part of the time in ground school. And generally, I teach at a couple of CPPPs each year as a flight instructor, and I usually fly with two people on Saturday for a couple of hours each and then fly with the same two people again again on Sunday for a couple of hours. And so unfortunately, I never get to sit down for more than one or two of the ground sessions at these uh, weekend long programs. But this time, COPA, the Cirrus Owner Pilots Association, offered to pay my way to just attend the ground sessions, which was an offer I just could not resist. And boy, was I glad I did. I learned a lot and came back from the weekend with just pages and pages of notes on a variety of details, uh, many of which were new to me. Now, the thing that surprised me the most was that the vast majority of the details taught would apply to just about any pilot flying any higher performance aircraft with a Garmin. 430 or a Garmin G1000 glass cockpit. And there were lots of courses on avionics, engine management, and weather, and also the opportunity to practice some of the avionics button pushing and simulator sessions. Now, the CPPPs are scheduled to be on four continents this year. Some of the upcoming locations include Poland in April, Knoxville, Tennessee, and Concord, California, and a mini one-day CPPP in New Orleans. All of those are going to be in May. And then in June, Williamsport, Pennsylvania, near my original hometown, and Avignon, France, both in June. Uh, Let's see, in July, St. Louis, and then uh, looking forward to August, it will be Nashua, New Hampshire, a one-day mini CPPP in Renton, Washington, and Furnas Park, Brazil. And then, uh, let's see, in uh, Baden-Baden, Germany, and a mini CPPP in Syracuse, all in September, and then a mini one-day CPPP in Chicago in October, and Houston, Texas, and Orange, Australia, both in November. So I'll be teaching in the Concord, California, CPPP in May, and I'll probably sign up for one of the international locations as well. And I'll include a link in the show notes, but you can always just go out to COPA's website, which is cirruspilots.org, to learn more about the Cirrus CPPPs. Well, after I got back from Las Vegas, I was home for just two nights before I drove up to Yosemite National Park with my wife, where we spent two nights in the park. Now, there had been major flooding, and the park was closed over the weekend, but it did reopen just two days before we got there. The views were really spectacular. We went out and did some hiking, and they have a lot of waterfalls there, all of which were uh, really running at pretty high capacity. So that was great to see a large amount of water coming down over them. 
Weather-wise, we lucked out. There was some light snow on the ground in the morning of the day that we departed, which was April 12th, but it was totally melted by the time we left in the late morning. And by the way, one of the funniest things that happened is I want to give a quick shout out to the bus driver. I'm sorry, I don't know his name. He was driving one of the free shuttle buses that takes visitors to the 20 or so stops along a loop that runs around the valley in Yosemite. And as we were getting on the bus, he spotted my Cirrus hat and he said that he'd been checked out in a Cirrus SR20. And after we got off the bus, I walked back around to the front to talk with him briefly. And he said he rents the SR20 at Merced Regional Airport through Gateway Air Center, which is also associated with the TDL, which is the Cirrus service center to which I'm often ferrying aircraft. Anyway, the bus driver mentioned that he liked flying the SR-20, as he said it was less complex than the Piper Arrow that he used to fly. So, if you live anywhere near Merced, California, and are interested in renting an SR-20, you might want to contact Gateway at the Merced Regional Airport. And say hello to your bus driver next time you're in Yosemite Park. And now coming up in a few days, I'm scheduled to fly to Boston, Massachusetts, where I'll spend a day with one of my daughters who lives there and then start a flight the next day from Plymouth, Massachusetts, all the way back to Palo Alto, California, in a Cirrus SR-22 that two local pilots have purchased together in a partnership. Now, I think this is going to be the longest trip I've done. I calculated it's 2,359 nautical miles if we were to fly a direct path between the two airports, which of course we won't. And that's about 150 miles further than a trip I made about six years ago. Ago when I brought a plane back from Fort Lauderdale. That was a Diamond DA-40 all the way back to Northern California. So I'll let you know more about that uh, trip as it progresses. Now, in the last episode, I mentioned that I posted a link on our Patreon page for a YouTube video showing a live computerized aviational sectional map that someone had built using a Raspberry Pi microcomputer. And it used basically LEDs to change colors to indicate what the weather conditions were at the different airports. Well, subsequently, I found a very detailed Google Docs instructions that someone just posted for building one of these live computerized aviation sectional maps. And if you'd like to build one, or at least see what it takes to build one, just go out to our Patreon page, click on post, and you'll find a link to it that I posted in early April, and it's titled Detailed Instructions Live Sectional Wall Map. Now, I bit the bullet. I ordered all the parts on Amazon. The cost was about $110, and at this point, I haven't even had time to open the boxes, but I'm really looking forward to playing with the Raspberry Pi computer and uh, kind of getting going on this project. So if anyone else decides to build one of these uh, computerized wall maps, let me know. We'll do it together. And hey, after you finish listening to this show, if you find yourself wanting just a little bit more, you can go out to our Patreon page because that's where all the goodies get posted. Uh, often things I talk about in the next show get posted a week or more ahead of time. And each time I post them, a little email goes out to everybody who signed up on Patreon and they can read about this stuff early. So I want to thank our new Patreon supporters, all of whom are giving at least $2 a month, charge to their credit card monthly. And they include Olivier Farine, Stephen Schroeder, uh, Gregory Matyas uh, just increased his pledge. Ben Davis, Jan Strumpf over in Deutschland, Rodolfo Castro, Robert McPherson, Eric Wallace, Vaughn DeCoster, and Paul Koch. Thanks so much for being supporters of the show. And during the first show of each month, I read the names of our biggest supporters who each contribute at least $20 a month. And those contributors are Jeremy Zawadny, who's a software developer, Peter Long, a pilot in Australia and former colleague CFI here in Silicon Valley. Seth Davis, also a flight instructor in Arkansas. You can find his podcast and flight school at gonogo.aero. Jason Blair, who's a DPE and pilot examiner, has a great blog at jasonblair.net. Joseph Haggerty II, who's a Mooney pilot and owner. And Michael Rogers, Cirrus owner and pilot in Southern California. Michael Spain, student pilot in Oklahoma, who says he's planning on buying a Cirrus. Larry Noe from New York, New York, where I used to live. He flies a Bonanza G36. Carl and Ann Rossi of Maine Cooncat Aviation. They're the proud owners and operators of three Cessna T240 aircraft. Roger Griggs, he's a turbine guy, has over 2,000 hours on a TBM 850, currently has a new Meridian 600. Uh, Troy Wisman, he's an IT guy down in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, flies a Turbo 182RG. And you can read about his plane and charitable flying at Wistman, W-H-I-S-T-M-A-N dot com. Chuck Price, a local guy who I fly with, he works for Too Simple, and you can read about artificial intelligence trucks they're building at tusimple.ai. Don Dillman, he's a professional pilot who runs a training center, and he owns a Bonanza F-33A, and congratulations to him for just reinstating his CFI. Stella Sue, who's a student pilot in the SR-20. She's a pilot that I recently streamed a flight lesson from on Facebook Live, and you can find that video on our Patreon site. 
Jonathan Weisswasser. He's a vascular surgeon, also a ham radio operator like myself, and he flies a Meridian. And Jim Barath, he runs uh, Sonics ESD, which specializes in active noise control uh, here in Northern California. And he flies a Cirrus SR22 G6. So I want to thank all of you for your contributions and thank everyone who helps support the show in any way, which could be just leaving a review for us or sending us feedback, recording questions, and all those kinds of things. And by the way, speaking of the Patreon page, let me just tell you about a couple of new stories I've listed out there. For example, I've just posted a YouTube video of the Sunflyer 2. Now, I mentioned that in the news section and that they have just done their first test flight in Colorado. This is a great looking airplane. To me, it looks vaguely reminiscent of the Lancer 320, uh, though it's got much longer landing gear and of course it's not retractable. So you might want to check out that video and take a peek of uh, what the Sunflyer 2 looks like. And you'll also, of course, see the aftermath of the Cessna Citation and Cessna 150 crash that I mentioned that occurred in Indiana. The tail of that Citation was completely sheared off, so it's a rather remarkable photo. Anyway, you can always get to our Patreon Patreon page by going to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. Look around, see what you like there. And if you choose to support the show by donating a couple dollars a month via your credit card, we definitely appreciate that as well. Coming up next, we've got my evaluation of headlamps for night flying. Stick around. Let's talk about night flying headlamps. I think the one thing I discovered is everybody likes the one that they own, but probably most people haven't tried a lot of different ones. And that's what I have now done. And I want to thank all my listeners who responded to episode 45, Night Flying Dangers, in which I mentioned that my favorite headlamp was one that I found at Costco, which had separate white and red lights that were both continuously variable. And you could easily switch on either the white light or either the red light. You didn't have to cycle through white to get to red. Absolutely love that light. And I got more feedback from that episode than any other prior episode. We had many listeners who wrote coming up with a total of about 10 different headlamp recommendations. So first, let me start off with Charlie. Charlie wrote, he said, I thought I'd offer a tip. I learned through experience. I had a complete electrical failure and lost everything in a Cessna 172. Obviously, no lights, no navigation, no flaps. Having experienced that, I highly recommend that one of your onboard flashlights be a headlamp. They're available for a few bucks at most home improvement stores and weigh very little. It allows me to see the gauges in the dark while keeping my hands free to be able to fly the plane. Well said, Charlie. That's why my favorite light in the cockpit is also a headlamp. Now, here are my criteria. I want a wide range of variability of the red light. Most of the headlamps that I see, they're way too bright. So I want something I can dim really far down. I don't want to have to cycle through the white light to get to the red light since seeing that bright light for a fraction of a second could destroy the eyes and night adaptation. And ideally, I want simple operation, just a single button that operates only the red light with little chance of accidentally turning on the white light. So my favorite uh, headlamp that I lost was called the LED Lenser, made by uh, Coast, and it was sold through Costco. Two separate switches for the red and the white, and a potentiometer so you could continuously vary either the red or the white light from high to low brightness. But unfortunately, even after searching through 10 different headlamps, I still can't find anything that quite meets all of these criteria. But let me tell you about the headlamps that were recommended and the ones that I tested. So Black Diamond makes a model called the Spot, and that was recommended by Lance in Florida and Lincoln in Maine. And Alan in California says that he has the Black Diamond Spot Storm version. Now that's about $10 more, and it adds a green light. Cheryl in Hawaii sent me a photo of a headlamp made by Coast that she had bought at Costco. Now, I just found the model number for it yesterday, which is the FL74. And yesterday, I ordered a two-pack of these headlamps for $28. And I'll let you know what I find out after they arrive uh, next week sometime. Now, Sporties has a dual-color headlamp. And that was recommended by both Derek in Missouri and by Phil in Maryland. L.L. Bean has a baseball hat with built-in LEDs recommended by Brian in Virginia. The Petzl Tika, T-I-K-K-A, recommended by Chris in Seattle and Tim in South Carolina. The Coast FL11, recommended by Paul in California. Now, that's probably the closest to my old Coast headlamp in some regards, so I bought it just to try it out. Now, there were a few others recommended that I didn't purchase. Uh, those included the Princeton Tech Sync. That was recommended by Moj here in California. I looked at one at REI, but it didn't appear that the red was variable, so I didn't uh, purchase that. 
Also, the Princeton Tech Quad 4 LED headlamp recommended by Jarrett D. Via Twitter, he said he had it for a few years and quite a few flight hours and it worked well, except the hinge broke, which he fixed with super glue. Now, I read reviews on Amazon that also mentioned this hinge breaking, so I ruled that out as well. Also, it sounded like you had to switch lenses on uh, this uh, Tech Quad 4 to go between red and white, which may just didn't sound very convenient when you're in a dark cockpit. And the Cabalas Alaskan Guide XR Headlamp by Princeton Tech was recommended by Ron in Utah. Now, it sounded like the red light wasn't variable, uh, so it did perhaps sound like it had two levels of red light, but I didn't uh, uh, buy that because it didn't sound like it was variable. He said that it was fairly simple operation. Press the button, red LED on, press it again, bright red LED. Press and hold, white LED, press again, bright white LED. I usually hang it around my neck on flights, and I like it because the first press is always red, avoiding the chance that I accidentally turn on a white light at night. And I agree. I think that's that's a really nice feature. You don't want to have to go through white to get to red. And then there's also the Ultra Bright Cree, C-R-E-E, -E, LED headlamp that was recommended by Jarrett L via Twitter. And that one didn't have variability for the red mode either. It said it had the constant red and the strobe red. And I saw some other lights with a strobe red as well. That's not exactly I want to see uh, while I'm in the cockpit. <laughs> So last night I took all six of these headlamps that I had and went out to uh, an airplane, Cessna 172, sat out there on the ramp in the dark uh, just to see how each of them would work in the cockpit, see how bright they were and all those kinds of things. <laughs> I'll tell you, it was an odd experience. Uh, toward the end of my experimentation, uh, another aircraft uh, pulled up and parked and uh, eventually you know, pushed back into the spot right next to me. Uh, just as I was climbing out of the airplane, I think I had one foot on the ground, I heard this huge noise and I felt the shaking and I was disoriented for a moment. Couldn't figure out what the heck was going on. Then I looked out toward the end of the wing and I saw that the gentleman had pushed his airplane back into the one I was sitting on. So the wings were overlapped by a couple of inches and he must have been moving pretty fast because his airplane wing uh, was almost uh, undermined the full uh, depth of the wing. So a couple of feet back. Uh, anyway, I was not uh, too impressed by his airmanship. <laughs> So we we inspected the wings. There didn't appear to be any damage. But, of course, I sent a note off to our safety office and the maintenance to have them inspect the wings. So all I can say is, people, the flying is not done when you land. The flying is not done until you have carefully put the airplane back in its place and tied it down. So that was a rather odd end to my testing last night. Anyway, the first two lights I tested were the Black Diamond Spot and the Spot Storm. Now, I purchased a spot, and I actually found a spot storm that had been left in an airplane, and so I was able to test both versions. Lance wrote about the spot that this headlamp has a red night vision light, two white LEDs with different intensity settings, and runs on three AA batteries. It's my favorite night flight accessory. Lincoln says, I love it primarily because the red mode is, in fact, infinitely variable. You have to get it in the red mode and then hold the button down to vary between maximum and minimum brightness. It also remembers the brightness level as long as you don't switch into the white light mode. Uh, Lincoln went to the trouble of creating a video to demonstrate for me how the brightness is varied. He posted it on YouTube so I can see it, and I really want to thank him for that. That was certainly one of the things that convinced me to buy this light. Now, Alan in California says he has the Black Diamond Spot Storm. Now, that one has a green light uh, in it as well, though he didn't mention the green light. He said, head over to REI and check out their selection. I got my Black Diamond headlamp there. Spot Storm does have white and red LEDs and a spot and a flood uh, white light and a press to hold to lock or unlock, which minimizes the problem of accidental discharge while sitting in the flight bag. And I try that out. You hold the button down for four seconds, I believe, and that prevents the light from accidentally being uh, pushed on. He says, with the bright white spot, I can use it for pre-flight if needed, including peering deep into the tight cowl of my Mooney or nosing around in the gear wells and with the dim white flood or red for in-cockpit in-flight lighting. Now, when I got my spot in the mail, I struggled a little bit to get the batteries into it. It was probably the most difficult of all the lights to get batteries into, but you wouldn't have to do that frequently. Uh, it uses three double A's. As I mentioned before, it was the only headlight where the red was continuously variable. However, it's got a relatively wide beam width on the red light, unlike the name spot, which might imply a more narrow beam. The beam width is actually fairly wide. When I tested it in the cockpit, it lit up the entire instrument panel. I would have preferred to be able to narrow that beam down to maybe just my 
half of the airplane so I wouldn't be throwing a light uh, on a co-pilot. Also, there was just a single button for selecting red and white. I'd prefer to see two separate buttons. Now, the good thing is that once you select a particular color, either red or white, just simply pushing the button on and off takes you back to that particular light. Then after you turn it on, if you let up from the button and press again, it will dim that light. But it's easy to make a mistake. If when you go to turn it on, you forget to press and release and instead hold the button down, the light will switch to the next mode, which if you're on red, turns out to be a very, very bright white light. Now, they say it's 300 lumens and it can throw a beam 80 meters. You know, that's not the kind of uh, light you want accidentally coming on in the cockpit uh, just because you, you push the button incorrectly. Now, there were also an interesting little mode, uh, which was called power tap. And on the side, if you tap the side of the light, it would turn on a second light, which happens to be a fairly bright white light. Uh, and I tapped it, but it was kind of inconsistent. Uh, sometimes I would you know, tap it hard, it wouldn't turn on. Sometimes tap it lightly, it would come on. And I actually found when I was in the cockpit that one time I touched the side accidentally and it made the switch to the very bright white light. So I found that just a little bit disconcerting that I could accidentally lightly touch the side of the headlamp and suddenly have a bright white light in the cockpit. Now, when I did have the red light on for the diamond uh, spot, the I could see very clearly to write, and that was with the dimmest uh, setting. And I could also read text fairly clearly as well. I also tested the green light of the spot storm, and it really did full illumination of the cabin as well, even at minimum uh, setting, just like the red light. It was a little hard to read writing with a green light and a little bit more difficult to uh, read the printed text, but you could obviously brighten that up if you wanted to do it. So overall, I found that the pros of the black diamond spot were that if you only use it for red, then once you have it set to the correct brightness, you can just simply switch it on and switch it off to get to your red light and have it be at the proper brightness, which is great. The cons were that if you screw things up when you push the buttons, which was easy to do, uh, of course, I didn't have a whole lot of practice, but I suppose over time you could learn to do this very consistently. But if you push the buttons in correctly, you're going to end up with a very very bright white light that can destroy your night vision in just a second. So given that limitation, I would probably use this black diamond spot as a dedicated red light and bring along another mag light or some separate light for when I wanted white light. But that being said, I still rank this as tied for a first place uh, with the next one we'll talk about, though neither one of them, even though they were tied for first place, met all of the uh, features that I had in the original uh, LED Lenser that I lost. So that's still a little disappointing. Still looking for the uh, the perfect light here. This next light was from Sporties, and Derek in Missouri wrote, I have this headlight and love it. Two levels of light for both red and white. Now, this was the simplest packaging of uh, any of the units that I uh, bought, and it was just very easy to open it up quickly. And also, it was very easy to open the battery compartment, which was nice. It uses three double A's. Now, this was the only product I tried that had a separate switch for the red light and for the white light. Now, this is huge because it really simplifies operation so that you don't end up accidentally switching on the white light by accident. That is, provided you remember which switch is which. And if you'd like to know, well, the red light switch is on the right. So just think R for red, R for right. And both of the switches, of course, are on the top of the unit. So the left switch is going to be the white light. Now, the downsides, the LEDs are not continuously variable. They're just two lighting levels. And the lowest levels uh, turns on two red LEDs and the highest levels turn on four. And you'll have to cycle through both brightness levels. The first push turns on two LEDs. And then when you go to turn it off, you're going to have to first turn on four LEDs. And the last push will turn your red light completely off. Now, the specs say the red LEDs are two lumens. And if you're only using the red light, the runtime is about 20 hours, which is certainly a lot of night flying time. Now, the one downside I noticed to the red light is that you end up with a light that appears to have concentric rings with varying brightness of red. So, for example, on both setting of the red, if you have a very bright red center, it's going to be surrounded by dimmer rings of red-white light. And the same turns out to be true for the white light as well. And you can think of this as being similar to an old conventional flashlight. You know, the old flashlights didn't put out a pure white light. Uh, you would see kind of motley white where there'd be, you know, a bright little center and then, you know, some rings around that. That's exactly what this light is doing. Now, there is one feature that's kind of interesting, though, unfortunately, it only applies to the white beam. And that is that there's an outer ring, much like the focusing ring on a camera lens, which as you turn it, it varies the beam width of the white beam from a narrow focus beam to a wider beam. Now, that could be handy, especially if you're flying with someone else to try and keep the light on your side of the cockpit. 
And by the way, one problem with all headlamps, it's so easy to turn and look at the pilot you're with and blind them. So keep that in mind. You know, try to be a good neighbor when you're in the cockpit and not blind your <clears throat> CFI. When I tested this in the cockpit, I found that the red had a much more focused beam. So it really only lit up my half of the airplane, which was nice as compared to the, the black diamond spot. Now, it's a little bit brighter than the diamond uh, when both of them are on their uh, dimmest setting. So it was easy to read and write with it. And I found it you know, not that distracting or annoying that it didn't have a pure beam, that the red was a little bit mottled uh, and you know had some uh, concentric rings around it. Of course, when I turn off the red, I did have to cycle through bright red, which I was not thrilled about. But I love of the simple operation. One button, very easy to get the red on and off without accidentally coming up with a white light. By the way, the white light on that headlamp is just entirely too bright, even on its lowest setting. If you use that in the cockpit, it's definitely going to hurt your uh, night adaptation of your eyes. So overall, this product, which is sporty sells as the dual color pilot's headlamp for $29.95. Pros, it's got a separate switch for the red light and two levels of red light that are more focused than the black diamond spot and hence aren't going to spill over into your co-pilot side of the plane. The cons, well, the red light doesn't produce an even brightness, but that doesn't seem to be that big a deal. So I tie this with the uh, black diamond, but again, <laughs> neither of them tick all the boxes for what I'm looking for. Now, the third unit I tested was the Petzl Tika. It was very easy to open the battery compartment and put in the three AAA batteries. No manual with this one, just some printed notes on the inside of the box cover, and <laughs> it used icons. And they were so small, I had to pull out my reading glasses to read them. Now, operation, simple, and there's only one button. You hold the button down for a few seconds to switch between the white and the red light, and you press the button to cycle through the brightness settings. But while there are three brightness levels for the white light, eh, there's just one brightness level for the red light. So that was kind of disappointing, though you can switch it into a red strobe mode where it turns red light on and off. Well, that's not very helpful in the cockpit, but uh, anytime you go to switch off the red mode, you end up first putting it in the strobe mode. So that's a little annoying to uh, have a strobing red light, though it won't last for long if you quickly push the button again. Now the white mode always comes up in the lowest brightness, which is nice. And then you have to cycle up to get to the brightness you want, and you can turn it off at any brightness without having to cycle through all three white brightness modes. So if you wanted to use just the dimmest mode for white, uh, then you pretty effectively have an on-off level for that uh, brightness. Now, the red beam width is more narrow than the black diamond spot, which is nice. When I tested it in the airplane, it again just lit up my half of the cockpit, which would keep the light out from my neighbor's uh, side of the cockpit. Uh, the lowest white light I found very acceptable in the cockpit, but the two white levels levels, eh, just way too bright for the cockpit. And of course, when you're switching from white to red, it was easy to accidentally get the very bright white light, which is a bad thing in the cockpit. So overall, I was not thrilled about it. I will mention that they do have a rechargeable battery option. And while that might be good for the environment, I find rechargeables just don't hold their charge as long as alkalines. And if you don't fly at night often and you go six months between flights, you might find that a rechargeable battery has discharged. I didn't try it, but I'm more predisposed to use the alkalines. Overall, the pros are that you can set it up so that red is just a single button push on and off. And if you accidentally happen to switch it to white, at least it's going to come up on the lowest brightness, unlike the black diamond spot, which has a very bright white light if you accidentally switch that on. On the con side, the red is not variable. It's just one brightness, and it's relatively bright red light uh, compared to the others that we tested. So I'm afraid I will be sending the Petzl Tika back to Amazon. Now, the next slide I tested was the Coast FL11. Nobody had recommended that, but from looking at the Coast website, I thought it might be a good replacement for my favorite headlight, which had been a Coast. It was easy to install the two AAA batteries, so just two batteries that won't last as long. And on the outside of the package, there was a nice red Try It sticker with an arrow that points to the single button on top of the headlamp. So even before I opened the package, I was able to press the button and I saw it cycle through. First, it would turn on three bright white LEDs push it again and those LEDs went to a dimmer setting. Third push and the white LEDs went off and a single red LED came on. Fourth push would turn that red LED into a strobe mode and the fifth push would turn it off. Well, unfortunately, that white light was really, really bright, way too bright for the cockpit. There was a fairly 
uh, narrow beam, which was nice, but again, it was just too bright. I also found it unacceptable that you always have to cycle through the white light to get to the red light. Uh, this light I thought was, was blinding uh, in the cockpit with the white. So it's just not what you would want in the cockpit. Uh, though it does have one of the more focused red lights, which means you're less likely to, you know, throw light on your partner. Overall, the pros, it had a nice narrow red beam. The cons, as I said, you always get that bright white light before you get to the red light. And that just makes this light a non-starter for me and for should be for anybody else who's concerned about preserving their night vision in the cockpit. So the Coast F11 will be going back to the manufacturer. Now, the sixth and final item that I tested was a baseball cap from L.L. Bean, and Brian in Virginia talks about it. He said, regarding a headlamp, I find the L.L. Bean baseball cap with two lights in the front of the brim to be the perfect flying companion, especially if I'll be out after dark. The lights are not too bright, but they always shine right where you need to see something. I tend to wear a cap as a sun visor in the late afternoon and early morning, so the brim works for that, too. The big advantage is I don't have to dig around in my flight bag for a flashlight. It's right there on my head all day. Well, I thought this was really a pretty cool idea, uh, similar in a sense to a headlamp. No red light. So I was really looking for something that was a red light solution, but the whole concept sounded so intriguing, I just had to go ahead and order one. I think it was uh, $29.95 to get the blue cap. And what I like most about this solution is its simplicity. And you know, when I pulled it out of the box, all I had to do was pop it on my head and push a button and it was ready to go. The button is embedded in the front of the hat in the bill, the brim, or the visor, depending on what, which name you use to call that hard part of the cap that sticks out front and shades your eyes. It's off on the left-hand side of the bill. It's pretty easy to just to uh, click it on. When you do that, it turns on, as they say, four powerful LEDs. And they say that two LEDs are angled down at 55 degrees to provide area lighting for a close-range task. That sounds pretty handy in the cockpit. Two LEDs angled forward for distance lighting produces 48 lumens of light, reaches out to 42 feet, up to 50 hours of operation on four CR2032 coin cell batteries. So my reaction is this hat is too bright for the cockpit. And that should not surprise you when you hear that the light reaches out 42 feet. The other thing is I'm not real thrilled with coin cell uh, batteries. I'm not really sure why. Maybe my perception is that they're more expensive and less readily available than the uh, AAA batteries. Uh, but that doesn't really seem to be a downside here because you probably wouldn't change them uh, that often. Now, that being said, I really like this hat for just walking around. I think this would be fine for pre-flight, you know, walking to and from the airplane. Personally, I just wouldn't use it inside the airplane in the cockpit because I think it's too bright and it would tend to keep your eyes from adapting to the darkness. So I think this cap is going to stay with me. <laughs> this will be added to the Max Tresca collection of, uh, of lighting fashion wear. And speaking of lighting fashion wear, I should mention that one of my other all-time favorite cockpit lights was something called the Glove Light. And there's a doctor up in Bangor, Maine. Uh, Paul had sent me one of these many years ago, and I really liked it. It was neoprene rubber, slips over your hand. There were a couple of LEDs by your fingertips. So it was really handy to write something. You just put this, turn on the switch, which was behind your thumb, and then you could go ahead and write, or you could point at something in the cockpit. It wasn't too bright for the cockpit just about the right amount of light. I really love the glove light. So I started looking around. It doesn't look like uh, the original glove light is still available, but I'm not sure. So I'll continue to research that and let you know if that's still available. So I will be testing the uh, Costco lights, the FL74, when that comes in. And I've got some leads on some other kind of non-traditional lights in the cockpit that might be even better than some of the things that we talked about here today. So I'll keep you apprised of that as I continue to research this topic. I'll also go ahead and put links into the show notes. You can always get to our show notes by just tapping on the artwork on your podcast player, and you'll find links to all these different lights that we've been talking about today. Coming up next, lots of listener feedback and questions. We'll be right back. And welcome back. Before we get to feedback, let me thank a couple of people who left reviews. John Weiswasser left a really long, nice review in the Apple Podcast app, formerly called iTunes. Yeah, among other things, he said, I finally hit Nirvana, so I think he likes the show. 
He also said I could easily be a professional radio host. John, I used to be. I worked for about five different stations a long time ago, uh, almost all of them uh, in front of the microphone. But I did work for CBS, and I was an employee there on the technical side, so doing engineering there. So, yes, I love radio. Also want to thank Atomic Auto. He left a review for our dedicated app for iOS. You can find that in the Apple App Store. And, of course, we also have a dedicated app available in the Google Play Store for Android phones. And Atomic Auto said that he liked likes listening uh, while he's in the car about his favorite pastime, which obviously must be aviation. Now let's turn to some listener feedback. This comes first from Flying Magazine senior editor, Rob Mark. Hey, hi, Max. I was listening to the uh, session on visual separation today, and a thought crossed my mind when I heard Keith's question. I think one other thing that he could have done to help improve the situation was to be a little more proactive uh, with the tower. Sometimes controllers are pretty good about that, but sometimes they need a nudge. I would have suggested something like, hey, Tower, what heading and altitude is the King Air climbing to? I think that kind of a call would have given the King Air pilot the heads up on where Keith was, and it would have given Keith a better idea of exactly what the King Air intended to do. And by the way, love the show. Keep up the good work. Rob, thanks for the excellent feedback. And listeners, you can always find out more about Rob and what he's writing in the pages of Flying Magazine or go out to his jetwine.com blog. Now, here's a email feedback from Carl in New York. He says, I enjoy the podcast and listening to episode 55 about entering and flying traffic patterns safely and how to orient yourself toward runways. You talked about placing a pencil over the heading indicator to help figure out the orientation of the runways at an unfamiliar airport. Here's another idea. Pilots can use the extended centerline feature on apps such as ForeFlight or integrate it into Garmin and other onboard GPS units. I know sometimes the desire is to minimize the chance of dependence on electronics, but I believe if you have them, use them. Just a thought as to one more way pilots can find their relative orientation to the runway that they are trying to approach. Carl, great idea. I love the extended centerline feature that's in the Garmin G1000 and the Cirrus Perspective. Uh, It basically makes it incredibly easy to find your way uh, to the runway. Uh, one downside, it doesn't show the runway numbers, so you still have to figure out uh, that part. You could follow the center line and find that you were following it to the wrong runway. Okay, let's turn now to listener questions. Hi, Max. This is Rob. I live in the New York City metropolitan area, and I'm considering flying my 2010 Cessna 172S across the U.S. and back. I wanted to know if you had any suggestions about best time of year to go. Right now, I'm thinking early fall. And two, routes, uh, especially over the mountains. I appreciate your help very much. Thank you. Rob, great question. I'm sure you're going to have a heck of a lot of fun flying across the country. Perfect timing because I'm leaving a couple of days for another trip starting in the Boston area, coming all the way back here. And I'm taking a look at the route information that I sent to the pilots uh, that I'll be flying along with. I told them basically that we could either take a northerly route that roughly follows Interstate 80. And to take that northern route, I would aim for Cheyenne, Wyoming, or thereabouts. Doesn't have to be exactly Cheyenne, but you want to be far enough north that you're missing some of the tallest of the Rocky Mountains uh, in the northern part of Colorado and southern Wyoming. From there, I would head to Rock Springs, which is right along Interstate 80, then towards Salt Lake City, Elko, Nevada, or Reno, Nevada, and then on to the San Francisco area or any place you want in the California area. And then if I were to fly a southern route, I usually start heading for Amarillo, Texas. Doesn't really matter again how you get there, but from Amarillo, Texas, then I would start heading toward Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, And then from there, I generally head to uh, Prescott, Arizona. I like Prescott because it's nice and high up above 5,000 feet, and it doesn't take as long to climb back up to altitude if I stop there. From there, I would go toward the Hector VOR, which would keep you outside of one of the restricted areas. Uh, By the way, one time I was there, a controller asked me if I would like uh, any help heading toward Hector, and I told him, sure, I'll take a vector to Hector. (laughs) To which he laughed. He said, I set myself up for that one. Anyway, you want to go over the Hector VOR, H-E-C, and then head for the Palmdale PMD VOR, and that'll keep you out of two different uh, restricted areas. And from Palmdale, you can either head toward Northern California or south toward uh, Southern 
California. And as to which route you would choose, well, it totally depends upon the weather or what states you're interested in visiting. So I never really know for sure on these trips until maybe a day or two ahead of time which route that I'm going to be taking. And even then, it may come down to that morning looking at the air mats to see you know, where there's less turbulence, less convective activity, uh, things like that. So I would plan to be incredibly flexible. Just have a general idea where you want to go uh, and kind of a general list of airports you might want to go to and then change that plan in real time because you're going to find that, you know, the winds will either be more favorable or less favorable. You might not make it to a planned fuel stop. Uh, so you're going to want to have a lot of flexibility. Bring along a lot of good in-flight tools as well, uh, different apps. And if ideally, uh, in-flight weather would be ideal as well. If you can have uh, XM weather or weather through ADSB uh, in, that's going to help you tremendously. In terms of uh, timing, sure, I think the fall sounds like a great time. Uh, if you were to leave you know, in the spring, yeah, it's going to, you know, sometimes you've got some, uh, you know, strong winds. Summertime, uh, of course, it gets hot and gets more turbulent. So, yeah, I think that the the fall is really an excellent time. Uh, but again, I think the, the key is just to have lots of flexibility. By the way, there is a, another route that is further north, uh, and that would uh, take you across Oregon and uh, Washington State. I've only really flown that once, so I can't give you as many uh, details about that. But I hope that helps, and thanks so much for your uh, question, Rob. And with that, let me encourage you to listen to bloopers at the end of the show, but also if you have a question you'd like answered on the show, just click on the artwork in your podcast player, and you'll find my contact information and a link where you can record questions from your smartphone, or just send me an email. You can find my contact in the show notes or by going to aviationnewstalk.com, click on contact at the top of the page. And also, if I can just ask for your help, please go ahead and tell one of your friends about the show. That's how most people find the show is when people like you take a moment to tell them about the show. And if they're not real familiar with podcasts, just send them to the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store and look for our dedicated Aviation News Talk podcast app. And if you think that someday you might buy a new or slightly used Cirrus, please contact me now. And if you've contacted me and I haven't gotten back to you, I apologize. I have been so busy the last couple of weeks. I will get in touch with you, but feel free to ping me again uh, if you'd like. Now, if you're looking at a new Cirrus, I can definitely help arrange a free demo flight for you. In any case, it can help you understand the many factors that are not all that obvious in buying a new versus a slightly used Cirrus. I specialize in the Cirrus and work with people around the world. Until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. Also from Flying Magazine, Cirrus has claimed one of the most prestigious aviation awards, the 2017th Roger J. Je <laughs> Roger, no, Robert. Oh.